Well, good morning, everyone. You all look very nice today. I just want to let you know. Thank you for, for looking so good. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what it's like to embrace new technology, both as a consumer of it, but also as the makers of it. And to start, I'd like to take us all back about a year ago. Some of you may remember the Juicero. The Juicero, it's great. It, it is an internet-connected fruit and vegetable juicer. And the big innovation of the Juicero is that it did not actually squeeze fruit or vegetables. It just squeezed these sort of pre-processed packets. But it turned out that actually you didn't technically need the Juicero to squeeze the, the packets, that you would get the exact same identical cup of juice by squeezing it just with your hands. And so here it is, after two minutes, same drink, right? And you might think, I don't know if I need this $700 machine to do this for me. It eventually found its way down to the very comfortable price of $400. Uh, maybe I don't need that, but actually, hang on, the technology is still important here because there was this uh, barcode on the thing. You could actually use the Juicero to scan the barcode and see what the expiration date was for the packet. That's, that's handy. The expiration date was also printed on the back of the packet. So, so you may think, you know, this is, here, we, here we have this device that has really no use or no function and does no work, but, t but takes your money, right? But, it, but it's fancy, it's new technology. It turns out, friends, that this is part of the uh, long history of abuses in designer juices. Uh, this juicer, designed by Philip Stark, just makes a mess if you try to use it to juice lemons. But it's okay, because Mr. Stark tells us that he did not design his juicer to squeeze lemons. It's for conversations. <laughs> That's some bullshit right there, right? This is the ego of the designer, or often of the technologist, sort of falling in love with the thing or the material more than the service that the thing might do. And I think that, and I believe that our job, when we're trying to create functional products, when we're marketing these things as something that you can actually use to do things, is that we should be of service to the people, not to the, not to the technology or to the, to the material. Uh, how can we instead sort of take our enthusiasm for the making of the thing, but also share that in terms of the, an enthusiasm with the service that the thing might do? Again, the modern kitchen, though, full of stuff like this. Here is a Wi-Fi-enabled kettle. I know you've all been waiting for it. Um, there was a Brit named Mark Rittman who owns one of these, and he set about trying to make a cup of tea and sort of shared his experience online. The kettle immediately encountered a little bit of network trouble here. It turns out that it couldn't connect, and the kettle asked to be recalibrated, right? Turns out, you know, it's sort of three hours later, it had sabotaged his local network, right? The kettle had slipped into some unknown nether region of the network, and Mark, though, he is undefeated. He is port scanning the network in search of his kettle. Ten hours later, friends, he's got it, he's got it going, but uh, his smart lights have cut out because they needed a firmware upgrade so his family is eating in the dark. The internet was not especially sympathetic, as you might expect. <laughs> Apologies for the language, I'm just the messenger here. But I think you can understand what's happening. Here's another review of yet another sort of connected uh, kitchen product from Fast Company. It doesn't even matter what the model is, because I think that at this point, we recognize this description of a lot of new technologies that we encounter, right? Automated yet distracting, boastful yet mediocre, confident yet wrong. You could substitute this review for any number of overreaching products and fragile technologies that or maybe sort of prematurely put out there as a product. And you can almost hear sort of the tech bro who's pitching this. It's like, I work at the intersection of technology and hubris, right? It's like we feel this, this thing a lot as consumers, but we experience it too as designers. We often, through our, our uh, enthusiasm for the technology, will sort of push something out before it's, it's ready. But I think these are signals that we don't yet understand the grain of a technology, the texture of it, how it wants to be used. And what I mean by that is it's these questions about how do we use technology in a way that it wants to be used, in a way that adds meaning to our lives, or maybe even better, amplifies the human potential. And I'll talk about that a little bit. I think that right now, as we look at, at machine learning, there's often an effort to replace human judgment or human agency, and I think instead there's an opportunity to focus it and amplify it, and that's what we'll talk about today. Because I think these questions are especially important when we turn into 
new chapters of technology. And I believe that's one of those times that we're working in digital design at an incredibly exciting moment with the arrival of a new design material called machine learning. Uh, I run a design studio, as Sarah said, called Big Medium in New York City. Uh, and we're focused on design for what's next. And for the last decade or so, a lot of that focus was on mobile, sort of exploring the frontiers of what mobile could do with a with this sort of sensor-packed device in our pockets and handbags. Over the last couple of years, though, more and more, that's been a shift, as my client companies have been coming to me and say, what can we do with data? What can we do with machine learning? And I believe that if mobile defined the last decade of digital product design, that machine learning is already defining the next, and that it's a little bit sort of past time for designers to be involved in this. Um, so when I say that machine learning is a design material, I mean just like HTML and CSS are design materials, or as uh, prose and text is a design material, or dense data is a design material. Like any design material, it's important to understand its texture, not only how it can be used, but again, how it wants to be used. So whenever we encounter a new design material, a new technology, uh, I think that it means asking these questions. What can it do for us? What is its grain? How does it want to be used? What are its strengths and its, that we design to and its weaknesses that we design around? But also, how does it change us in using it? sometimes intentionally or not intentionally. I think a lot of us are already feeling, kind of culturally, the shifts that algorithms are having in our lives, both desired and undesired. So I want to explore those things and, and take a look at what that looks like for machine learning, if that sounds all right with you. That's how we're going to spend the day, sort of like looking at these three the next hour or so. You guys all right with that? You, you look great. <laughs> all right, okay. Well, then let's start here. What can it do for us? Or put another way, why would we team up with machine learning, especially as designers? I think the promise of machine learning is that it lets us detect patterns in anything and then act on them. What might we do with that? You know, machine learning already drives so many of the digital products that we use every day. For better and for worse, algorithms determine the news that we see, the movies that we watch, the products that are surfaced to us, the way that we drive home from work. So this is all due to the pattern-matching power of machine learning surfacing generally useful insights. And what does that mean for you and for your everyday practice? That's what I want to talk about here, is how do we actually start to incorporate this with the tools and, and, and abilities that we already have into products that we're already building in our, in our everyday practice. Just very quickly, I want to sort of talk about there's sort of five applications of machine learning as a way to, to frame this. I'll give you examples of a few of these things. First recommendation is one kind of use. So Slack launched a feature about a year ago for big teams that helps you find people who talk about certain topics. So this is machine learning that helps you find experts in your organization. If you need an expert in hiring process, well, it turns out Isabella is your go-to. So this is recommendation, very familiar, right? A ranked list of documents that match a specific context or concept. Here it's actually using sort of semantic search, right? So it's, it's improving on brute force keyword searches to sort of say, oh, here's people who match concepts or areas of expertise. So this is closely related to classification, which I'll talk about in a moment, but also to prediction. So let's talk about that. Predictive keyboards, another example of everyday machine learning, the statistically most likely next word showing up above the keyboard. It's this simple intervention to speed this error-prone task of, of touchscreen typing. And that's prediction, right? Based on historical data, here are the things that are most likely to happen next. Classification, Google Forms, which is likely familiar to many of you. When you add your questions, you choose the format of the answer that you want. So the default here is multiple choice. Uh, radio buttons, but there are a lot of options here. They've made it as simple as they could, but it still takes some time and thought to process that, to make a decision. But look what happens when you start typing the question text and how that changes the answer format, the default. How satisfied are you maps to a linear scale? So they've added a little machine learning to the mix to look at your question and then classify it to a specific answer type. So which of the following apply maps to checkboxes? Uh, so it's just a convenient little bit of intelligence to make the process a little bit easier. So as you're typing the question, the default changes so that when you get to that field, that suggestion is waiting for you there. So classification is human-generated categories where the machines map content or data 
into those categories. And in this case, they've already got all this training data before they even added that information of all of the question text and categories that people have done by hand. They just sort of taught the, to the machines, too. So you heard it here first, friends. Sprinkle a little machine learning on it. And what I mean by sprinkling it is that there's, this, these are not exactly fancy, big, artificial intelligence, where's my sentient robot butler kinds of features, right? These are like small interventions in existing products or features to make them uh, easier. You know, look how mundane these examples are. And so this is what I mean when machine learning can be part of the everyday products that we make, is that they can be used to elevate those products. I think we need to get as comfortable designing for the algorithm as we've become designing for small screens, for example, in the last few years. Or just like it's second nature to add a little bit of JavaScript to a web page, to sprinkle a little interaction into it, we can also sprinkle a little intelligence into it using the machine learning services that are available to us now and to you to use today, right away. So this is uh, an enhancement, this kind of enhancement, I think, is already part of the everyday practice for sort of a select few companies for now, but it's ready for all of us, and I think it's coming to everyone very shortly. So what I'd like you to sort of take away broadly from this is that it's time to kind of get cozy with these casual uses of machine learning. We could bring a little bit of humility, in a sense, to this fancy new technology. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It can be part of the everyday flows that we create. So in many cases right now, machine learning is in fact best deployed for sort of small, narrow interventions that solve critical tasks in any sort of specific flow. There are bigger opportunities, though, too. So let's see what happens when we aim machine learning at the kind of work that we do as designers. You might remember uh, Google QuickDraw from a couple of years ago. This was Pictionary that you could play with the machines, right? And so it would prompt you to draw a picture, uh, so draw a mountain. And so you go ahead, sort of start doing it. Mountain's pretty easy. I think I can do this. I know it's a mountain, right? Gets it. Draw a calculator. Here we go. It's a square. It's a triangle. It's an elbow. It's a dishwasher. It's a calculator. All right, not too bad. All right, we're doing all right. A couple more of these. Draw a hamburger. I see a shoe, a hot dog, a hot tub, bread. It's a hamburger. Yeah, I didn't even get to draw in the lettuce or tomatoes on that one. Flip-flops, last one. All right. It's a nose. It's a potato. It's a peanut. It's flip-flops. It's not a flip-flop. I'm not even close to a flip-flop, right? And yet it got it, like, right away. So one of the things that was interesting about this, too, is that it would let you sort of go back and, and look at what, other, what, what some of the other candidates were. And we see here's flip-flops. It's also, it turns out, very close to potato and bread. <laughs> the symbol for flip-flop is very close to these. But that's sort of the point, is that these are symbols. So when we look at how other people drew these, they probably were a little bit better at their flip-flops than, than I was. But these are all sort of, you start to see this commonality. These are not, you know, sort of uh, realistic, real-life flip-flops. These are all the symbol for a flip-flop. So we have taught the machines a variety of different ways to draw a symbol for a concept. Now, it turns out that we draw symbols all the time in our work, right? What if we could teach the machines to understand these symbols? And in fact, there are a number of projects that are experimenting with this right now. One of them is a project called Weezerd, I guess. It's like UIZerd, like GUI, Weezerd, you decide. Weezerd, all right. So it's a web app, and it uses both classification and generation to create content. Uh, so if we look at this, it lets you take a picture, in this case, of this sketch that I made of a very simple inbox, snap a picture of it. And about 30 seconds later or so, it's ready to go. Let me take you over to the desktop experience, and we'll take a look at it there. On the left, we have the, uh, the sketch that I drew, and on the right is the comp that it generated there as a result of it. Not too bad. We've got two search boxes for some reason, but it did pretty well. It creates both Sketch and HTML. I know what you're thinking about the HTML, but it's actually pretty well formed. But let's take a look at, this, at the Sketch file for now and, and see what happens when we, we look in there at the file that it generated. What we can see is that it, it created this thing, but all of those different elements are individual, editable uh, Sketch symbols that we can get in there. So we can edit the text, move the individual images around. So basically what it's done is it's taken all the symbols that we had on the page and turned them into sketch symbols. In fact, if we drill in here to, for example, just on this text field, we can go in and see, oh, here is the library of, of symbols for this sketch file. So you see what's happened. It's basically just sort of learned a set of hand-drawn symbols that are familiar from wireframes 
and map those to symbols in Sketch. Now, the thing is, of course, this may not match the style of your application, right? They let you sort of edit some of those things. And likewise, the code that it generates, while well-formed, may not match your code style or your CSS or your class names, right? Now, it turns out, though, that if you think about what it's doing, that it's like these are uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, this is basically sort of a design system that's within this, and it's taught the, the machine to, to map symbols to that design system, mapping patterns to a familiar vocabulary. Now, when we do that for humans, we call that a design system, right? The whole idea is creating a standard vocabulary and a standard set of, of common patterns, common solutions. So if you've established that already, you can share that language with the machines too. Add to it the symbols and notations that you already use. And there are already some experiments with that. Airbnb, during a hackathon, had mapped some symbols to some of the patterns that they have. So in the course of a day, they were already generating Airbnb screens, simple prototypes, by doing these sort of sketches. But speaking of vocabulary, maybe you don't even need the sketch in the first place. If we sort of follow this path down, you can say, hey, Alexa, I'd like a prototype, please. And you have this, right? Now, some of you might be thinking, hey, wait a second, that sounds a lot like my job. That's what, that's, that's what I do. That's not the real crux of your job, right? This is sort of the clerical part, transcribing a design, assembling known patterns from a sketch into something else. The real part of the job, where the real thinking happens, is figuring out what the problem is that you're trying to solve. What are the correct patterns to use? Do we need new ones, or have we already solved this problem? So this is sort of basically this assembly. It's sort of the dumb part of what we do, in some sense. Uh, and so the machines can help us with that. So in fact, if you think about it, sort of this sort of production is kind of the time-consuming, repetitive, detail-oriented, error-prone, and frankly, often joyless part of our job. And this is not the stuff that we wake up excited for in the morning. I can't wait for more joyless tasks, right? <laughs> But the machines love that stuff. This is actually exactly what they're good at. So what are the tedious jobs that people find painful? What can we sort of do about that? So, for example, uh, we did some work with a healthcare company, and they were zeroing in on ways to help radiologists do their, better, do their job better. And radiologists, the folks who look at x-rays and, and image scans to find problems. And so much of their time is actually spent looking at scan after scan after scan. It's not so much sort of like figuring out this one problem. It's looking at, for, at a bunch of scans, trying to find problems. Most of the work, looking at scans without problems, nothing there at all. So only occasionally do they find a mass and engage their actual skill to determine what that mass is, what it means for the patient. So uh, what this company was able to do is to get camera vision to do a huge amount of triage so that the radiologists could apply their actual expertise reviewing all of these things with a high degree of sensitivity. We didn't want any false negatives. But basically, the job of the machines was to bring the radiologists interesting cases. They took over that time-consuming, repetitive, error-prone, joyless task of triage so that the, the radiologists could engage their real skill, sort of let them do what they do best. And that's really, I think, the opportunity for machine learning, is to actually let people do what they do best by letting the machines do what they do best. They are almost never the same thing. So how can we amplify our humanity, our judgment, our agency, by supporting our activities in ways that are uniquely possible through machine learning? And again, the, the idea here is not to replace attention or judgment, but to focus it, to bring the interesting cases where we can apply our, our most creative selves, um, clear away that noise. Our industry has spent a lot of time to make the machines smarter. So I think there's a, a, a moment and an opportunity now to put a premium on how we might augment human capability, start with that human need and understand how machines can help. And so I think there's sort of four ways to, to think about that, of sort of the, the, prob, the kind of problems that we can solve with machine learning. And one of them is to be smarter with questions we already ask. That Slack example is one of those. You know, we can use classification or clustering to understand conceptual relationships between documents or people or products. And what I mean by that Slack example, right, is that it used to be that we would have to search for just keyword search and search through all these kinds of messages and sort of find the themes that fit. It's like, oh yeah, this person does talk a lot about this. 
we can answer that question more easily by sort of this semantic matching of, of, being, of, of grouping people by concept. So being smarter with questions that we already ask. But we can also ask entirely new kinds of questions. Uh, so for example, instead of a keyword search, we can ask questions by emotion. So consider someone who's a customer care representative dealing with a mountain of email. They could queue up emails that have anger or urgency or concern, sort of the most important or sort of critical emails. Or, you know, they want to start their day off gently. It's like, like some kind words, please. I'd like to search for kind words in my email. It's a new kind of search, a new kind of question. What we're seeing more and more of, of course, is also that we can also unlock new sources of data. So the machines are finally able to understand all the messy ways that we communicate as human beings through speech, through video, through photographs, through doodles, through those symbols we were talking about. Uh, if the machines can now sort of find meaning in those data sources, we can certainly tap them as data sources, but as we've also already seen, as a new kind of interaction, a new surface of interaction, like we're seeing with speech assistants, like we're seeing with augmented reality, or even sort of uh, sketches as an interface. And the last thing, and I think maybe this is the most sort of powerful and mysterious bit, is that we can surface invisible patterns, stuff that we are not able to see either because of the scale of the pattern or simply sort of the strange perspective that machines can bring to sort of seeing things. Being able to group uh, and find um, uh, disease or fraud or, or crime or just uh, groups of products or people who match sort of a certain pattern or are similar in the same way. So there's a, this opportunity to find those kinds of new things. But in all of it, the job for designers here is to figure out what are the problems that are worth solving. Of those sort of four categories of things, what are the opportunities and how can we actually insert ourselves into that sort of human journey, like the radiologists, and find that point where we can really sort of help to replace some of those joyless tasks and again sort of focus human judgment. What's that human need, and how can machines help to solve it? All right, so that's why you would use machine learning. How do you work with it, though? What is the, the grain of it? What is the texture of this? What are its strengths and weaknesses? There are many, but today I'm just going to share three. And the first one is friends. The machines are freaking weird, right? They kind of come up with really sometimes surprising conclusions after sort of sifting through enormous volumes of evidence and data, they kind of come to conclusions that we wouldn't normally expect or certainly come to uh, as humans. So, for example, it takes a human being about 14,000 brain hours to learn to run. Now, it turns out that an artificial intelligence or a neural network can figure out how to run in less than half as many CPU hours, but the results are like this, right? Just so using the arms, with sort of forward momentum, right? Very few considerations of physics or the realities of rotator cuffs. But then again, if you think about it, we also come up with some pretty strange approaches to locomotion ourselves. You might recall the prancer size craze of 2013. She's got it figured out. So when people are so difficult to understand, so often unpredictable, so eccentric. How can we expect the machines always to make sense of what's happening? So in other words, if the machines are weird, it's in part because, friends, we are weird, right? We may never totally understand what we look like to the machines on the other side. We communicate in ways uh, that are not always predictable, certainly behave in ways that are not always predictable or understandable to each other or that themselves are sometimes somewhat fanciful, right? So what do the machines make of us as creators or as artists? This Renoir painting uh, is in the collection of the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. And when the curators at the Barnes ran their collection through a computer vision algorithm uh, for identification and to sort of find connections between their works, the robots came in and confidently identified this picture as a boy holding a teddy bear. Now, you might think this, this is sort of a, like, all right, let's put this project to bed. I think we're probably not going to be able to auto-tag all of our works using this system. But they didn't actually strictly see this as a failure. When they asked a neural network to find cherubs in their collection, it found things that were definitely not cherubs, but also were kind of cherub-like. And the curators began to find some interesting connections, ones that they had not made before through sort of more classical schools of art. So it was sort of a productive friction, a way that they could look at their collection 
in a new way. Shelley Bernstein led this machine learning effort, and she described these connections as magic. That these unexpected results had generated sort of new insights. So I think that's sort of a, the first lesson here that I want to say here is that the strangeness and weirdness of the machines is at once a liability and an asset. That we can use sort of their strange perspective on the world as a as a productive friction. The patterns and connections that they make can surface themes、uh, that might otherwise be invisible to us. So we're looking at connections between artworks, but you can also use it, as I mentioned before, to identify clusters of products or customers、uh, or people by behaviors or associations that might not be immediately obvious or apparent to us. The unexpected. So I'm going to use that as an awkward segue to talk about unexpected visitors. Uh, a gentleman named B.J. May has one of those Nest doorbells. You know what I'm talking about, with the camera and the creepy surveillance on him.、Uh, so he had set his up so that it, if it didn't recognize a face, it would automatically lock the door.、Uh, and one day it locked on him. So when he went to look to、uh, investigate by looking at the app's history, he saw that the system had spotted a new person and was like, "Do you want to let this guy in?" <laughs> Looks angry. I'm locking the door, right? So all to say, the machines perceive and interpret the world very differently than we do. So weirdness and unpredictability and mistakes are essential to this design material.、And、the more that I work with machine-generated results, machine-generated conclusions, and especially machine-generated interactions, where the machines are the ones talking directly to the unpredictable humans on the other side, the more I realize I am not in control of this experience as a designer, and that's new. You know, we're used to designing a fixed path through information and interactions that we control. We're used to designing for the happy path for success. Now we have to anticipate unknown content with a fuzzy range of results. And so, a lot of actually the way that we can kind of cushion and anticipate those results is actually through manner, or of course, as you all well know, base app. Be as smart as a puppy, friends. This is a phrase from Matt Jones of the late great digital agency Berg London, as sort of a pioneer in connected devices and digital weirdness. Matt is now at Google, and he came up with this way to think about creating honest, gentle interfaces for weird systems.、Uh, so our goal should be making smart things that don't try to be too smart and that make endearing failures in their attempts to learn and improve, like a puppy. And it's like, oh, that's adorable how it failed. I love you so much. Right, so like puppies or like robot soccer players. So elusive, can it contain him? Snapping ankles along the way. Run again! This run is uncontainable. Drops、oh! goal. Adorable, right? And we can almost anticipate. The failure here, right? It's sort of it's something that we can anticipate it, we can forgive it, we can recover from it, and it may sometimes be annoying. Even puppies are annoying, but it won't surprise us or, at worst, endanger us because we sort of can anticipate this problem. Too often, what, when machines make a mistake, though, it feels more like this. <laughs> Not a baby. Not a baby. Just a dummy. Just a test. Just a test. Sorry, everybody. All right, and that's about the design, right? How do we cushion mistakes? How do we set expectations so we don't get that jolt of surprise when something goes wrong? Because really, you know, this is always our job as designers, but it is especially important in this realm that our job is to set expectations and channel behavior in ways that match the actual capabilities of the system. Alexa and Siri and Google Assistant. All set the expectation. The invitation is: ask me anything. And as capable and remarkable as these systems are, and they are, they always fail at that expectation. You can't ask them anything. They always let us down when, we, when that is the expectation that that's set.、Uh, so we run into those sort of miscalibrated expectations all the time. Nobody knows that better than Pick Deskbot. Pick Deskbot is a Twitter bot that takes. Sort of random images from Wikimedia and sends them to Microsoft's image recognition、uh, service, and sort of dutifully reports the machine-generated caption. And you can see it actually handles pretty, you know, sort of sophisticated images. This poetic rendering of a lush green field, right?、Uh, it's kind of charming and weird when it gets confused. 
Uh, you may be familiar with the new Samsung phone here. <laughs> it just, they just keep getting bigger, more and more features, yeah. The problem here is not just that it's not accurate, that's a data science problem, but it's sort of the undeserved confidence of the statement, right? And that's a problem of presentation, of design. This is absolutely a guy holding a cell phone. We find that actually research on machine-generated descriptions finds that most people prefer results that are vague to those that are just wrong, right? So when the algorithm's confidence is low about the answer, and we'll look at that in a moment, it's better to dial down the specificity to improve accuracy, right? So this is actually better, if not exactly super descriptive. But what if we split the difference and offer some of the low confidence possibilities in the way that a human might? Right? So it's a person holding an object that's maybe a cell phone, or maybe even suggest multiple competing signals or possibilities. You know, that could also be maybe a guitar or a violin. And so if you think about sort of presenting this, for example, uh, to someone with a visual disability, you're starting to actually sort of help them to understand that the machines aren't sure, engage sort of some skepticism here, rather than just sort of putting forth a, an error. So in other words, because the machines are weird, we actually have to match our language and our manner to the ability of the system and the confidence that we have in it, the confidence that the machines have. They're very honest in terms of when they're guessing and when they don't know what they're, they're doing. So the thing that this enables is this flexibility uh, to sort of report the confidence in the answer. And, it, and that's important because this is sort of the second thing I want to talk about here, is that machine learning is probabilistic. We tend to think of the machines delivering an answer, and they do not see the world that way. Machine learning sees the world in shades of gray. Per, you know, it, it's, it is zero to one confidence, and one is never true, right? Nothing is fixed. It's all probabilities. It's algorithms that are explicit about their confidence in predictions. This is the statistical likelihood that this is sort of the answer. You can investigate this yourself using one of the many sort of very easy-to-use machine learning services out there, which you can plug right into your own applications. Microsoft's cognitive services is one example. Amazon, Google, IBM all have similar offerings. Basically, essentially free to experiment and prototype. Uh, and you get sort of all the superpowers of the big technology companies by using these, of computer vision, of speech recognition, uh, text-to-speech, all the sort of stuff that you think of as being kind of like the fancy machine learning stuff, all the big guys are sort of giving away for free now and are very easy to use and work with. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, anyway, just to give it a spin, just to give you a sense, I am just self-involved enough that I'm going to go ahead and give it, uh, Microsoft's image recognition service a picture of me and sort of see what comes back. And you get this structured data in return. So these are your working ingredients as a designer. It's important to understand the nuance. And it actually does pretty well, right? It's like, it's like looking, it's a, it's a man looking at the camera, confidence of 89%. That's pretty good. I'm not totally sure about some of the, I don't know. And actually, wait a second. <laughs> this is a, this is, I'm working on it, but it sticks with you, something like this, right? It's like, it's hard not to take that. A little bit personally, right? So, come on. But look at the percentages to get sort of a sense of the confidence here. So we've got sort of things down here at the tags at the bottom. We've got a person with 99.97% confidence. A man, 97.67% confidence. Indoors, older, I'm happy to say, only 28% confident. So it's not older, it's older, right? <laughs> Maybe an aging elephant could be. <laughs> Right? And in fact, when you look at the description above, the tags at the top, you'll see that they're actually sorted in order of confidence. So person, man, indoor, looking, standing are the tags that it associates with. I'm happy to say elephant is pretty low on the list, uh, a few steps behind woman. Uh, so, it, but it's, so it's interesting, it's like this is actually some nuance, right? It is suggesting what it is confident about and what it's guessing about, and it's explicit about that. And so if you can sort of get the texture of the service that you're using, and if you trust its confidence, if you're confident in its confidence, then you actually, as a designer, have a lot of material to work with to sort of have some varied responses. And now look, as much as I admit that it is sort of important to me whether I, or not I look like an ancient elephant, there are more important kind of things at risk here. The stakes for this kind of image recognition are far higher for other contexts. So we're starting to see, for example, Amazon licensing its image recognition to law enforcement agencies to do pattern matching or predictive policing 
to pluck suspects out of the wild. And that's serious. You know, are the machines up to it? The American Civil Liberties Union put this to a test and uh, ran photos of the U.S. Congress against a data set of 25,000 mugshots and got 28 matches. So Amazon has apparently confirmed with science that the American Congress is a bunch of crooks. Uh, but if we look under the hood here, what happened is that the ACLU left the setting to the default, which declares a match when there's 80% or better confidence. And Amazon countered they weren't exactly happy about this kind of press and said, whoa, we tell police departments to use at least 95% confidence. This is a probabilistic tool, they were saying. You have to choose an appropriate level of probability to match the seriousness of the problem. But in a way, that makes the ACLU's point. The machines require careful tending. Those of us close to the machines need to understand how confident and accurate they are. As the ones designing the interface, we need to be familiar with this material. Right? But we also need the people who are using this, the civilians, to sort of understand what this means. You know, what, what is the implication of this? What kind of system is this? How do I think about or understand the confidence of the system? Because this has real impact, in this case, really potentially hurtful impact. So a lot of things, and this is, friends, this is true for us as well as the machines, I don't know is often better than a wrong answer. But I think I know can be good. Right? Maybe this is an older man, could be an elephant. The manner that we express it sort of ex helps, helps to, to get across the confidence of these systems. Which means the, the question and opportunity here is not how do we present answers, but how do we present suggestions or signals. I think that that is like one of the really important things about doing this. That right now, we're often sort of presenting the one true answer. Here's your one true news feed. Here is the ideal Instagram feed for you. One answer. You're going to remove your agency as a user and hide the signals that are determining that. But what if we surface those signals and instead let people act on those instead? The way that we think about those signals is important too, though, because there are always signals that are relative to a baseline. This is the, the third and last thing I'm going to mention in terms of the, the texture of working with machine learning. It's that the machines reinforce normal. The whole idea of machine learning is to teach the model what normal is and then find deviations from normal, right? Because then it, if it knows what normal is, it can predict or recommend the next normal thing or identify things that are outside the norm things like fraud or crime or disease. But what is normal and according to whom? You know, when you ask Microsoft's image recognition service to identify this picture of David Bowie, it sees a 29-year-old woman. So at a moment when our culture is in the thick of a shifting understanding of gender and sexuality, how are the machines expected to keep up? Normal is a mutable idea, a subjective notion that's kind of constantly changing with culture. Our data is often historical and fixed. And so if normal is changing and rarely and pretty much never a perfect idea, how do the, how do the machines handle it? Right? So a system's output is only as good as its input. And so what if the prevailing notion of normal is actually garbage? What if our machines learn from us our own bad or dubious choices? What if they absorb and reinforce existing inequalities or leave out entire categories of people? Amazon, a few months ago, discovered that the system it uses to filter and recommend people for jobs was biased against women. The historical data, the characteristics that they had optimized the system for, favored men. And that is bad news, right? The less bad news is that when they discovered this, they pulled the system and started to evaluate their hiring practices. So the machines had sort of innocently revealed this systemic problem even as it sought to reinforce it. And so if there is a silver lining to this, and I want to reinforce this is a troubling issue, but if there is a silver lining, it's that surfacing bias lets us act on it. The machines surface this bias naively, without obfuscation. They are not embarrassed. They're just like, here's the answer. Right? They make obvious what's always lurked beneath. So this reveals the problems that we have to solve or address, maybe in our mathematical models for how these systems work, but probably also in other ways, in ways that our culture operates or the limitations of our own narrow professional views or circles. So when bias is revealed, we have the opportunity to act on it. It gives us signals for necessary change. So we may not be able to eliminate bias from our data, but we can certainly surface that bias as a call to action. 
So that brings us to maybe the third chapter that I want to talk about here, which is how does this stuff change us? How do our values and behaviors shift by letting the machines do more of our work? I think a big question is what intentions are we going to bring to this technology as the designers and developers who are making this stuff? How willing are we to consider that things are going to go wrong and that the technology will have unintended consequences? It brings the, the kind of the big thing that I want to leave here is that we should be intentional about this. The soft, all software has values built into it. Software is inherently political, and sometimes we may not be aware of it, the values that go into it, the business models that are cooked into it. But I think we need to be intentional about what those things are, be really honest about what are we optimizing these systems for, what aren't we, what are we, by optimizing one thing, unconsciously perhaps de-optimizing. So I think that the one thing we want, don't want is for the future to be self-driving. Let's be intentional about it, because otherwise it's the technology that runs the show. It's the tea kettle holding the Rittman family hostage, you know, working hard to restore the network just to normalize their life and keep the kettle happy. Right? Let's be explicit about the vision that we want, not just how we want the tech to function, but what, might it, what it might enable. So just a very quick example. What if when you're sick, the machines can handle the diagnosis? Now, if the experience ended there, if that was your net experience of the health system, that would be abject. That would be even more soulless than the current experience that I experience in, in the U.S. with my healthcare system in New York. But what if then the doctor comes in? And their job is not to do the analysis, the machines have already done it, but to deliver the message in a way that is caring and warm, where the doctor will let patients tell their stories. Instead of the five minutes that I get with my doctor, I might get time to feel heard and ask questions and be reassured. And perhaps, that caregiver doesn't need as much education as the doctor, right? Which makes for cheaper health care, which is the real problem in the U.S., and which also means we can have more caregivers for more jobs. So better care, lower health costs, more jobs. But we have to go into building a system like that with intention, because if the intention is simply efficiency, we end with the robots giving us the care, and that's it. And we lose all these other benefits. How are we as designers going to get involved in the actual business model the design community for decades was like, we need a seat at the table. And now we're sort of using it by talking about what colors we should use, when we actually have the, a stronger opportunity to set the values and business models of the companies that, that we're doing, the products that we make. So instead of humans working for the machines, the Rittmans chasing their kettle through their network, the machines can amplify our potential by doing our joyless work for us, delivering new insight from it. We don't have to be passive recipients of an algorithmic news feed. There are new design patterns to be invented. So instead of hijacking our agency, the machines can augment our judgment right, so that we can be more creative, more insightful, and more compassionate. Because this is our choice. This is the people in this room. You know, we get to decide how these products work and look and behave. Machine learning gives us these powerful tools for meaningful change and for human insight. And as we've seen, if mishandled, things can go wrong in ways large and small. But I'm optimistic. I choose to be excited about this. This new design material is ready to use today. It needs designers thinking and input. The developers and data scientists who've been sort of running it with it so far have shown us what's possible. Now we can sort of think about how do we actually put this to use in ways that fit in people's lives, right? So machine learning services like Microsoft Cognitive Services that we saw before, or IBM's, or Google's, or Amazon's, all these things are within the skills that you have right now to put to use. Put those tools to work in your everyday practice, to solve small problems or even more audacious projects. You have the chance today, again, in your everyday practice, to make something amazing. So please do that. If you're interested in this, I have just a few resources I'll share with you. One is mindfultechnology.com. It is uh, sort of a resource and a movement, really, about helping to create products that focus attention instead of distract it. uvetagenda.org is uh, the output of a retreat that I was part of, of researchers and academics and designers and science fiction writers about the questions we need to ask about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And finally, my own site, bigmedium.com, where you can find more writings and talks about this, and perhaps I can help your company figure this stuff out. With that, there's only one thing left to be said. So let's stop talking and do some walking. Thank you very much, friends.
so Thank much. You. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions. Um, when it comes to designers engaging with machine learning, I, there is a question related to that. Um, like when machine learning can be used to output visual design, by uh, is that still a creative process? Isn't there a risk to let all interfaces be the same? Shouldn't humans be in charge of creative, creating creative things? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I would sort of the, this is a, a really a common that we a question that we could put to design systems in general. I think that there's a concern that by collecting sort of a set of prefab patterns that we're somehow creating a bunch of canned interfaces. And I think really the thing is that sort of more like how do we actually take problem, pick solutions that have already been solved a million times and just sort of say, this is the solution that we're using for our organization, for example. We don't have to solve this problem. Again, this is a waste of resources and, and time and creativity, frankly. So if we sort of say, you know what, let's just use a design system to assemble the parts that we already know how to do, where there is no sort of question about that, and instead focus the humans on figuring out what is the problem to solve, what are the proper components to use for that, uh, then we're sort of putting the human attention on that portion of the design, the new part of the design, and letting the machine sort of put together the part that's already solved, that doesn't actually need our attention. So really, in a sense, it's sort of actually putting to use our design systems in the best possible way so that we can focus that, that human creativity on the new and, and the, the new problems that remain to be solved. I think, just sort of quickly on that, I think that there are probably a lot of designers out there, I know I feel this way, that feel like we're doing too much production and not, much, not enough problem solving. Uh, production of sort of problems that are already solved. And when I talk about uh, uh, ways that the machines can help us with some of these sort of, frankly, redundant tasks, joyless tasks, that's part of it. That part of it, that sort of rote production work, is not the creative part of our work. All right. So um, another question is, how do we avoid empowering business decision makers to employ AI to optimize for the wrong things to the detriment of the customer? Like think A-B testing, for example, taken to an extreme to financially squeeze an individual. Yeah, I mean, I think that the important thing for designers to be part of as a conversation, for, for anybody in an organization to be a part of, is to really just very much clarify what, is, what are the values of this company or of this product. And it could be that you'll discover by having frank conversations that your company's values are to emphasize profit by exploiting employees uh, and customers, Uber. Uh, <laughs> and, and in that case, you know, it could be, you know what, maybe this isn't the company for me. But you may also have an opportunity to sort of say, you know what, let's actually investigate what the values are that we want to have and think about the incentives and business models that connect that. The true work of user experience is not simply advocating for the user. I think that that is something though, that, that designers often do, and with good reason, but it is not only that. That sets you up in an adversarial relationship with the business. The true work is to find that narrow path that connects business goals and the proper values that you want it to have. Find that narrow path, connect it to user and human needs in a way that, that actually works for both sides, and light that path as brightly as you can. Uh, and I think that that is the work and opportunity of designers, is to underscore the, 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 the better part of our organizations and to do the difficult work of figuring out how to connect those so that one side doesn't streamroll the other. Great. That, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Sarah, Cheers. you're done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.